all right, you have an experience and it becomes part of you. Mm -hmm. And so how does that inform what happens next? Yeah. How does that cause you to grow in another direction or think another thought or, or be able to use that past experience as an asset. Hey, welcome to another episode of the Coffee Break Podcast, where our mission is to share business ideas, practices, and strategies while we enjoy our cup of coffee. Pretty excited about today's guest. It's Keith Larson. Now, I used to listen to Keith Larson on the radio for many number of years, and it's really cool to have him in the studio chatting a little bit about marketing. Through and through, he's a student. He's a student of people. He's a student of storytelling, and he's a story student of marketing. And he's going to be sharing a little bit of the behind the scenes with us today. I want you to grab a cup of coffee, some notebooks, and everything because it's going to be fun. We'll talk a little bit about how he uh, came to be a guest on the podcast. And uh, I hope you'll enjoy the rapid fire questions as well. It's going to be a fun conversation. This is one that you'll probably want to share. So before we get too far, I do want to ask you if you haven't already to subscribe. Uh, make sure you do that either through Facebook or YouTube. You can click the like or subscribe button there. And if you enjoy the audio version, well, you can do that on whatever podcast platform you enjoy listening to. Just hit the subscribe button because we have a brand new episode coming out every Tuesday morning at 9 a.m. Thank you for sharing this with folks that, you're, that are going to get value out of it. If you know anybody that's a student of marketing or connecting with people, they're going to enjoy this one. So grab a cup of coffee and get ready for this conversation. We got so much to say. We got a podcast to make. We're sipping on lattes and it's time for a coffee break. It's time for a coffee break. Oh, yeah. Keith, thanks for being here today. Yeah. I'm Pre excited. Appreciate the opportunity. Yeah, it's uh, it's been cool. So uh, we'll 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 talk a little bit more about this in a moment uh, about how how you're here or why you're here um, from a from a fun tweet. I, there's been a few guests that I've gotten on just from random direct messages or or tweets or something like that, and this is one of those. So we'll talk about that. But <laughs> but first, okay, we we've got to jump into rapid fire five randomly selected okay. questions with unknown point values just to get under your skin, All and right. then we will give you a score at the end. Sounds good. I like the sound of this, unless I suck at it. Yeah, so. unless unless you suck at it, but we'll 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 go for there. All right, All here right. we go. Question number one: What's one time where you took a risk and it paid off? Took a risk and paid off when I left uh, the advertising agency that I was with in the late 90s and jumped back into radio and went to work doing afternoons in Huntsville, Alabama for about zero money and dragged my family there mm -hmm. on the belief that we would, you know, kind of get back into the radio path. So we took that risk, family with me, mm -hmm. and it worked out. There you go. And then you, that's that's was before you landed in Charlotte, correct? Yeah, I was there. I, I left the agency. The agency was based out of Buckhead, Atlanta. Left the agency, went over to Huntsville, worked there for a couple of years. And uh, people from WBT had heard what I was doing. And so I got a you know, call to come to Charlotte. There you go. All right. Question number two. When you're feeling unmotivated, what do you do to recharge? When I'm feeling unmotivated, what do I do to recharge? Do you mean, I just want to ask, do you mean like work motivation or life uh, kind of? There's not a lot either. of rules to this game. Not a lot of rules? Yeah, you can pick what you want. Yeah. Well, you know, when, when you have obligations, they are motivating. I mean, it, reality can be pretty motivating. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when you still have family and four dogs and all of that kind of thing. Um, I, 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 like to, uh, I like to kick out Friday evening, Saturday uh, be out back of where we live. We, we live on Lake Tillery. And, and so, uh, got a little space there, a little nature space. And so I, I do a lot in the way of reading, mm -hmm. you know, you can say meditation, I guess, mm -hmm. um, connecting outside and that sort of thing. And, and that, is a big recharge for me, uh, physically, mentally on all fronts. There you go. So some, some time outside and some reading. Yeah. All right. Well, I'm gonna, that'll be a follow-up question. Your answers line. are you? better. You're, you're saying like, like shorter and punchy. I guess that's what you want in, in the, what do you call it? Lightning round? Fire? fire uh, Rap rapid fire. Rapid fire. It's, yeah, it's right. whatever you want. Right. There's really no rules. Really no rules. Just the score. Question <laughs> number three, which gives you more energy, starting a big project or finishing up on all the details? Starting a big project. All right, why? Yeah, definitely. Uh, because by the time I'm finishing up all of the details, and it does, I mean, that does feel good. Mm -hmm. 
and I do finish my details. Sure. But it's like Jerry Seinfeld uh, said about guys and remote controls. Guys aren't interested in what's on TV. Uh, guys are interested in what else is on TV. And so, uh, you know, the next thing, the next yeah. project, the next uh, challenge. So uh, I, I would have to say, yeah, next challenge. The next challenge. All right. Question number four. What part of your life are you most passionate about? Uh, it, life. Uh, family. I mean, truly. Um, family. And what that has grown in uh, to be for me over all the years is pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, great kids all doing their own thing, um, you know, wife, life. So it definitely. All right. Question number five. Have you ever taken a personality test? And if so, what did you learn? ENTJ. ENTJ. Yeah. Intriguing. Yeah. I'm not sure I remember what all that means anymore. Mm -hmm. I just, you know, always remember from Myers-Briggs those <laughs> Uh, the the E N T J, um, and I, I, it's like um, extra. I, I think that's extroverted, um, but you but you get um, energy from the inside uh, mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know. So you, you're reacting as though you know more about what the hell that is than I do. <laughs> I, I can't. I can't remember what it is. I just know the acronym. You just know the letters. I just know the top line. Well, I'm an INTJ, so okay. you can carry the conversation. Well, see, I'm the extroverted, and you're yep. the introverted yep. of the NTJ. That I, I do remember. Yeah, the and rest of it, it doesn't really matter. It doesn't. It's just a bunch of crap they sold to a lot of companies in the 90s. I mean, you had to... <laughs> you, you had to go through, you know, first it was Myers-Briggs. Then you had to go through Stephen Covey. Mm -hmm. Then you had to go through uh, Zen Delaney. Mm -hmm. it, I mean, it, it, every t there's just a next thing all the time if you're in corporate uh, America. Coming up with seminars and workshops is great, great uh, money for, for somebody. Just get one company to buy into it, and then you're, <laughs> then you're off. <laughs> all right, congratulations. You passed rapid fire. We'll give you a score of 916. Okay, great. Yeah. On a scale of like a million or? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. All right, very cool. Uh, thank you for participating in that. Sure. It's, it's interesting. Ian TJ, I can see that. Okay, let's, let's dive into it. So uh, you sent out a tweet the other, a couple of months ago. Now, I guess I'm actually really ago. curious about this because you said we've hooked up uh, here to do this because of a tweet and I have no recollection of it whatsoever. But that's normally that's even better. That's my my case. That's so you, my... you sent out a tweet that said there aren't enough people doing podcast. Every single human <laughs> should do one. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, I still you know, I still believe that there's a lot of room. And people think the podcast space is crowded. No, not at all. There's, uh, so I'm sure there's two or three people not doing them. I responded to you and said, hey, I've got one. Would you like to be a guest? And you were like, ah, okay. So, <laughs> really, was I that dismissive? I, no, I don't no, think you, I was that you said dismissive. you said absolutely. Send me some information. Sure. So, I, I appreciate you being here. So, kind of uh, short. I'll give you a little bit of a short st short story to kind of understand this, and to probably why I was even following you on Twitter uh, many years ago when you came to the Charlotte market uh, on WBT. Uh, I was working in a small town AM radio station, and I was working the noon to three shift. And I think you were on from, I feel like nine to noon. Nine to noon, yeah. Okay. Uh, and so I would listen to you on the way to, to my deal. And then when I started, uh, when I shifted careers and started with LockDoc Security uh, in 2004, you were part of my radio listening because there wasn't a whole lot else to do when you were driving a van around for <laughs> several hours to, a, a day. Uh, and it was interesting to, to, to hear, obviously, you know, the morning um, and listening to all the different folks on radio at that time. And then satellite radio came in and all this stuff was happening, right? Uh, and then you can c continue to keep a consistent uh, theme going through your radio show and you were building community around that. You did motorcycle rides for charity. Uh, you had your, just the whole concept around what uh, ideas and poking people in the eye, right? To, to kind of question the norm and you were building community. Uh, and there were people that probably were annoyed with you and there were people that were all right behind you on everything that you were asking. So it was interesting to see that. Obviously, uh, years later, you, you're not there anymore and you're doing other things. And I've, so I've just kind of kept an eye on what was happening and uh, recently saw uh, some of the stuff that you had been doing. So I thought it would be interesting to kind of pick your brain around the concept of marketing and how you're applying that. 
I've got more questions on that, but I know that's a long statement to get into a question. <laughs> uh, so that's that's how yeah. that's how we kind of arrived at this point. Uh, one, it, it's cool to have you here from, just from uh, just from listening to you on the radio for so many years, but uh, to kind of see where you are at this point and how you and how you've done that. So a lot of my questions are going to be around the idea of marketing and building community. Um, so. One, thank you for being here. No, oh, great. Uh, I, I appreciate it. I, pre- I appreciate the invitation. And and to hear you, you know, it, it's funny, and I have this experience sometimes, but to hear people describe what they took away from the show or how it sounded or, or what it consisted of mm-hmm. um, is, is just interesting. It's fascinating to me. It's actually, uh, I, I thank you for it. It's rewarding and it's fun because you've tapped. There were all sorts of things that I wasn't ever trying to do or be. And mm. not everybody understands that. Sure. A lot of people think if you're on AM radio in the 90s or the 2000s, you must want to be Rush Limbaugh. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I never had an interest in that or anything like that. Mm. What I was interested in, honestly, was, you know, just just creating a certain time, moment, and space of this show. Yeah. You know, uh, uh, of of people, of stuff going on, of kinds of conversations. And yeah, it had some eye poking. It, it had some meat and potatoes on there um, f- for sure. But we just, we did this thing that we created. Mm-hmm. And when I hear somebody play some of the key pieces of it back like you just did, mm-hmm. I, I mean, I just, I really appreciate that because it's like, okay, well, some people got it. You know, they... They, they they kind of uh, got it, so that's fun. I think one of the interesting things, and, and this is not necessarily the heart of the conversation, but one of the interesting things, I remember one of the segments was, you know, my news and you're welcome to it or something. Yeah. I, I don't know what the title was, but something along that that line. And WBT is a conservative radio station, and you played an edge of you couldn't quite tell – were you always being sarcastic around it or were you really challenging it? And it, it just made you think. And that, I think that that was a big intriguing component of it. It was, it was a conversation around questioning the status quo or questioning what the norm was. And I think that that was a, probably a big component of why people connected with it. Well, it's interesting that people, a lot of people want to know what your label is Mm -hmm. more than they're interested in (laughs) what you're actually thinking yeah. or what you believe or, or who you are. They just want to know what the label is because mm-hmm. then they don't have to think anymore. Yeah. They don't have to understand anything anymore if you just know the label. It's like, you know, I always say labels are for soup cans. If it says chicken soup, you don't have to read the ingredients. Mm-hmm. It's just, it's chicken soup. Yeah. And all chicken soups are, you know, they're a little different, but they're pretty much the same. Mm-hmm. And that's what most of the voices on most radio, in particular, most AM radio, became over a period of decades for for several different reasons. But but for me, it was it was just, you know, well, call me this, call me that. Um, I'm I'm just coming from the place of questioning what seems to to, to make sense or not make sense to me, period. Yeah. And, and so if you think it's this or think it's that, okay. We understand the frustrations HOA board members and property managers face when deciding the best solution for their HOA and pool security. Should we use a keypad, hand out keys, or install a key card system? Do we even need cameras? These are some of the questions that are difficult to navigate, and we're here to help. At LockDock Security, we've spent over 20 years working with homeowners associations and property managers to find the system that best fits the pool and HOA needs. Camera systems for the front gate or front entrance, key card systems for the pool gates, or simply updating the gate so that it meets safety and code compliance. We like to take the guesswork out of the process to answer any questions and help find the right solution. Our mission is to help you protect your people and your property and that includes pools. Contact our team today to schedule your free consultation for your community. Let's jump into kind of the the trajectory. And and one of the, I guess one of the conversations I've been having with people here recently is, and I've been using the term leapfrog effect, and I don't necessarily know that's accurate or not, but I'll try to explain it and maybe, maybe it'll make sense. 
starting somewhere and and learning from an experience, then taking that and applying it to the next experience and building upon that and so forth and so on. So as I as I look back on on kind of your your career, you were in radio originally, I guess. I'm I'm making up some of this. Then you went into a lot of the marketing world, then you came back into radio and can then built back into the marketing and now you're in kind of a, a CEO a role or I guess a CEO role. All of those things along the line, they seem like they built on themselves each iteration. Do you think that's a, the case or is it just all completely separate iterations? No, it absolutely is. And what you should do, you, you need to figure out, okay, if the term is leapfrogging, if sure. it's going to be leapfrogging, uh, or if you want to tweak the term, and you need to come up with some ways to describe this and some charts and some overheads and some slides and some things because this could be your thing that you take to all the companies and, you know, become the next Simon Sinek or something like that. This could be your deal. And it is true in, in my case. And again, it, it's interesting to hear you um, describe it. And there's actually one small prequel piece to what you said. Because, okay. yes, I, I was in radio for 11 years. Then I was in marketing for 13, you know, McDonald's and one of its big agencies. And then I went back into radio. And then that allowed me to, to sort of get back into marketing even while I was still in radio in Charlotte. Mm -hmm. But the piece before the radio piece, yeah, I, something in me from when I was a kid, radio. So I, I always knew that was a place I wanted to go. Sure. My dad started with McDonald's in 1966. Interesting. When they had less than 1,000, fewer than 1,000 restaurants okay. um, in the entire system. Small little company. They leased three floors in a building in downtown Chicago. It was very small. And so I was around. He was, you know, an accountant. And so he was with McDonald's, and I, I saw the growth of McDonald's. And, and when I was in high school, I went to work in kind of the mailroom at McDonald's. They had moved out to Oak Brook. And so I was around business people, marketing people. Mm -hmm. Some of the people I knew best were some of the real iconic, creative marketing people of McDonald's in the, in the 70s, okay. which was an explosive era, era for McDonald's marketing. Not to age, you know, but you deserve a break today, all the explosion of Ronald McDonald, all this kind of stuff. So I had that as a backdrop. And, and so I knew and, and understood certain things about business, sales, marketing, promotion, franchise systems, how certain make money long before I really went into that yeah. as my specific career. And I, and I did always have a certain kind of taste for those pieces. And, and through most of my radio time, while what I was always primarily interested in, I was kind of in news first and then did an evening talk show and then mornings. But it was always just sort of creating that theater of the mind, that little space, like what you related to. But within that mm -hmm. was always a marketing sensibility sure, or a, a sales uh, kind of sensibility in, in that sense. So it, it it's interesting to hear you lay it out. And it, whether you call it leapfrogging or not, it's like, all right, you have an experience and it becomes part of you. Mm -hmm. And so how does that inform what happens next? Yeah. How does that cause you to grow in another direction or think another thought or, or be able to use that past experience as an asset? So for me, th they all have tied together. And while sometimes somebody can look at it and say, what the hell? You're here, you're here, you're here. No, th I mean, there's a lot of blend in those paths and they've fed each other uh, a lot. Yeah, uh, the the using the experience as an asset, I think that's that is a good way to phrase it because you are taking something that you learned, good, bad, whatever that experience was, and that's that's, that's one of the things that I've get I've gotten stuck on with people over the past is an experience is an experience. Label it good or bad, it was something that is building towards something else, and you're going to use it in one way or another for your next set of experiences. Right. Um, so. With that, and and this is one of the the interesting components of this, and I'm I'm intrigued by how how this plays out for you down the line. But the the part of the era that I saw or that I heard, I guess through uh, through your years at WBT, which was sixteen years, 
14 years? Well, I was uh, on the, I, I did a year, year and a half of uh, ESPN radio in Charlotte after. I was on BT for 14 and a half years. Okay. And it's, it's 16 total radio in Charlotte. Okay. So, so along that period, you were constantly creating connection points with an audience that stuck around, right? So you had, you had the po eye poking, you had the, the llama, right? Right. All of those <laughs> things that were just kind of, you could be listening just for a few moments, but those were things that you would pick up on consistency. And and what I had mentioned to you before we started recording was it's it it seems like that is kind of your philosophy or brand of marketing is this subtle integrated conversation that people that just connects with people and because you're building that community, it just makes sense, right? There, you don't even have to process a lot. It's just it's an easy thing to click click in with, and you just you just get it. Well, you, you're you, you're heading down a, a path where you're picking up a lot, and that's very insightful. So I would say this, you know, um, brand. I did this once. Go Google brand, and it's like five million hits. Okay. And people making loads of money running around selling all these complex views of brand and what it is and how to build it. And all it is is, is your brand is whatever it is in people's mind that they connect with you. Mm -hmm. That's it. Mm -hmm. Whether it's a logo, a color, a jingle, an experience, a good experience, all of that, it's just the connections that people have in their mind mm -hmm. with you. Okay whether you as a business, whether you as a radio uh, thing or whatever. Your point about the subtle, mm -hmm. with me personally, the, I, I'm just not comfortable with, with levels of self-marketing, self-promotion. Don't get me wrong. I said my name a million times every morning on the radio. But what, what I mean is, in fact, we had a philosophy, and in, in, in my producer, Mark, Thomas, for the longest time, would talk about this. You know, if, if people get it, great. And if they don't, that's okay. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I didn't like to explain things too literally. Mm -hmm. I, I hated having to explain what Lama was all about. It's a long story with a disappointing end. And yet, it, for a long time, it was on window stickers on thousands of cars in Charlotte. Okay. So, so that's the subtle piece for me because it was personal. What I enjoyed was... Yeah, I would do things. I would use certain words. I knew what I was doing in the creation of it, but I was happy to let people get that themselves mm -hmm. and process it however they would process it. With, with a business, it's the same thing. Mm -hmm. It's still the connections. It's all of the experiences. The business, and actually a lot of media people too, I mean, you, you need to be a little bit more literal. Mm -hmm. You need to be more deliberate. You, mm -hmm. you need to be out there, <clears throat> you know, churning and doing specific activities for gaining me mental space with people mm -hmm. or for ensuring that they're having the right kind of experience. So w for me with the radio piece, that had to just be a little bit more what my own sensibility could feel comfortable with. Mm -hmm. And however that would work with people, terrific. It's probably, though, also why I do get such a kick out of individual people who were listeners. Mm -hmm. What things will they play back? Mm -hmm. You know, somebody plays back this, somebody talks about that. So it's, it's you know, just kind of fun, and I just enjoyed the doing of it. But the principle mm -hmm. is the same. The principle is the exact same. And so the business has to look for what kind of connections can you build mm -hmm. with consumers so that they have a good thought of you and want to do it again. So finding the finding the connection point that resonates with your audience, regardless of if it's a radio audience or if it's your customer base, and uh, creating something that they can hang on to. I, I, I read one book, and I, I can't remember the name of it, which is probably a bad thing, but I read one book about uh, kind of building community, and it was, it was kind of creating, uh, cr creating those catchphrases, creating those things that – that everybody got and they it was kind of like a, a tribal chant effectively right? right like like a llama would be is is it's the people that get it get it and if you see somebody else and they say it or you see a sticker on their car then you know that they got it i guess right. it's the same thing with the folks that want to run marathons or half marathons and they have that sticker on the back of their right. car it's it's just this you know salute that it's that a we nod it. it's a connection yeah yeah so in finding that for your business and then connecting that to your audience and creating it where I, I'm, I'm kind of in this, in this space where 
oftentimes it's it, companies, and, and we probably do it at times, try to send out whatever we think that that message should be based off of our intellectual understanding of what we do. And it's too complicated for people to process. Uh, there's a, a book by, um, uh, oh man, it's, uh, it's called Story Brand, uh, Donald Miller. And he talks about uh, people have to burn too many calories to process the message. Mm-hmm. And so the simplification of it, just so that people don't, because pe- if, if you're forcing somebody to burn too many calories to understand what you're supposed to do, then they're just going to get turned off. Right. And I, th- I think that's the same thing with any of the messaging that, that we're talking about here is, is understanding, well, like, like you just said, if they get it, they get it. If they don't, I don't want to have to explain it. Well, if the message is simple enough, then you shouldn't have to explain it. To, to a degree, and that's particularly true if, if let's say, you know, you're... you're <laughs> I don't want to call myself an artist, but but let's say, I mean, friends of mine, the Avid brothers, I mean, Scott and Seth and them and Bob, they just go do what they do. Mm-hmm. They're just doing what they're doing. Yep. Just, and, you know, hopefully you get it. And it's not that they don't promote anything, but they just are who they are. On the radio show, for me, I just did what I did. Mm-hmm. And so in an organic way or a little bit in the way an artist just paints whatever they paint, I think sort of in that vein, mm-hmm. if you want to call it a little bit more artistic or even entertainment industry, maybe short of TV sitcom entertainment industry, sure. that's the exact opposite of everything I'm saying. Yeah. You know, a TV sitcom and the way that it has to package, merchandise itself, be this, tell you what it's going to be, tell you what the joke is going to be, tell the joke, and then hit the laugh track. So you can be more subtle in that fashion. A business does have to be more deliberate. Mm-hmm. Um, you, you just do. And what I've found is if you can kind of bridge a couple of thoughts. One is you're in business because you've got some idea, some proposition that you think somebody wants to buy. Mm -hmm. A thing, a service, an experience, or whatever. Mm -hmm. So there is a starting place that comes from the selling side, the wanting to sell side of any business. And, and you think things about that. You're doing it for various reasons. And so you have what you think. Yeah. And, and hopefully, and for the sake of a little conversation, let's presume that there's some merit to that. Sure. That, you, that, that okay, there's a good competitive advantage in that. You've landed on something. With Zen Massage, no contracts, no membership fees. Mm-hmm. We're the only one that does that. Okay, so we know we've got a proposition. So you have some story that you want to tell. Mm-hmm. But as you go forward, what you, what you want to do is pull from what people are telling you that means to them. Mm-hmm. My little secret was always, for my advertising clients and with Zen Massage, is to um, listen to people who are having the experience, mm-hmm. who are using you. Mm-hmm. And, and listen deeply, not just a little checkbox survey uh, things, but really listen deeply to what they're getting out of it, what it means to them. And, and so you'll find those descriptions. Sometimes you find the exact words. Mm-hmm. Sometimes you don't find the exact words, but you realize, oh, look at what they're saying here. And now with some marketing genius where you find an interesting way to say that. So what it, saying is you you have to start with some place that the business is moving forward trying to do something. Mm -hmm. But the closer you can get to tapping into what it's meaning and translating into people, Mm -hmm. the more effective your marketing is going to be. The most effective marketing, I know a lot of breakthrough out there and let's do this. The most effective marketing you can do as a matter of principle is to find out where people want to go and do that. Yeah. Find out what people like what's tripping their trigger, and do that, mm-hmm. you know, in some way. So we did a lot of interviewing for Zen Massage when we rebranded a few years ago, clients all over the place, their most committed clients, their heaviest user clients, and just really listen to how they would talk about what the experience meant to them. And they told us all kinds of literal things mm-hmm. about what it, what it meant and the getaway. I can't stand it when I have to cancel and this and my cell phone and my kids and my kids, and it's the best and all of this kind of stuff. And we processed all of that and came up with close your eyes and count to Zen, mm-hmm. which is suggestive of 
the nature of the experience and the getaway. But we came to that not by trying to come up with a great marketing line. Yeah. Those words came out of all of these really juicy descriptions of how much they love their escape and their getaway and what it means to them and physically and recharging. So that, that's my path um, on, on that front of the business proposition and, and the marketing and the development of a brand. So you're suggesting rather than tell the customers or potential customers what you think they should know, you should listen to them and let them tell you what they, the reason that they're choosing you. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely, because that's what, you see, because that's what has the potential to relate to somebody else. Yeah. That's what can connect in the minds of a potential other user, mm -hmm. even if they don't fully know it literally mm -hmm. as they're hearing it. It's mm -hmm. going to connect at sort of the psychographic, emotional decision-making level of them. Um, now, I mean, there are straight-out propositions. We, I promote, we do a lot of things, no contracts, no membership fees. You know, best price, uh, best value every day. That's totally different for Zen Massage from all of the other massage chains. Sure. So we communicate that in a very literal fashion. Yeah. But then as to the experience and this other piece, that's the close your eyes and count to Zen. And that's what has come so much from trying to get, okay, what's inside of these people who are loving us? Mm -hmm. How can we express that in ways that somebody else will quickly connect with? Because mm -hmm. they're connecting with the experience piece, not having to try to think it through and process it all for themselves. It, it connects uh, in, in, a, in a more literal and meaningful way. Yeah, it, it just on a side note, it's it's interesting because so the, you're saying you're the only one that does no contracts and no cancellation or no membership, membership fees, yeah. right? You've got that seems like that would be the stressful part of of the the pro, of the uh, of the interaction or the experience is is all of that, and so you're going somewhere to relax, but you have the stress along with that. Listen, I'm happy to spill it all. <laughs> Here's the thing, and I know what this is like. Mm -hmm. Massage Envy is a thousand centers and I'm nine. Mm -hmm. I know that. Mm -hmm. McDonald's was 14,000 centers when we laughed mm -hmm. at double drive through hamburger only joints in the 80s and the 90s. And it doesn't mean that any of them have become number one, mm -hmm. but it means that there's 500 uh, five guys out there yeah. and they're all doing great gangbusters um, business. And, and so my, my point is I, I, they're, they're who they are and they've grown for certain reasons. Here's the reasons mm -hmm. that those chains have grown in that way yeah. for the same, uh, reason that Henry Ford was able to make every model a black until somebody else came up with alternatives. <laughs> the, the <laughs> manufacturer, the business can have everything its exact way yeah. until somebody offers a better alternative. Mm -hmm. And it's just, I've, I've surveyed our clients in yep. markets. They hate contracts. Yep. They hate contracts. And you hit it right on the head. They're wanting to have this nice, relaxing, get away, close your eyes and, you know, count to Zen kind of experience. But first, the front desk is going to hassle them. And then the therapist is going to try and upgrade them. And then when they check out, the therapist is going to hassle them again. Mm -hmm. People hate contracts. Yeah. And so, all right, you know, we're... We're not going to be 500 tomorrow, but we've got the better business proposition. Yeah. Can you copy this key? That's a question we get asked about 3,422 times a year. And how can you actually be sure that the person who asked that question is supposed to get a copy of that key? Well, we think you should always know who can copy your keys to your business and your home because it could be your neighbor, an old employee, a contractor, or even worse, your mother-in-law. At LockDock Security, we believe in protected key systems, so you always know who has a copy of your key. To find out more, visit LockDock.net or stop by our Charlotte location. LockDock Security, helping you protect your people and your property. Okay, so here's maybe this is a this is a way in depth question. Maybe it's a simple answer. If that seems to be so straightforward, listen to your listen to your customer base, listen to your clients, understand what drives them, what motivates them just to choose your product or choose your service. Why do so many businesses struggle with that? Because you know, through this conversation, it seems very obvious. So why do people struggle with it? And maybe in your experience with talking with other clients that chose not to work with you, what was their what's what's their hiccup? Well, it. <laughs> It, it's too simple. 
it's it's too straightforward. Mm-hmm. It doesn't take as much conference room time. It, it it doesn't take as much. Remember a few minutes ago you were saying uh, the story is so complicated for business to tell. Uh, yeah. It's because they're cooking up complicated stories to have to tell. Um, it, it really is just much simpler mm-hmm. um, than a lot of people make it out to be. A, a lot of business and a lot of marketing is, which doesn't mean that difficulties don't occur, which doesn't, you know, guarantee that I'm successful or any. I mean, we, we all deal with the realities and the marketplace every single day. But on a fundamental basis, yeah, just keep it simple. Keep boiling it um, down. And, and the other reason, and this applies to some other businesses as well, but I will tell you that within the massage business, mm-hmm. uh, it's because these other centers – they built themselves, these couple of chains, uh, they, they've built themselves around a back-of-the-house financial model that mm. requires memberships and uh, contracts mm. and this sort of thing for built-in revenue. But if, but if you think about that, and if the client would think about this, see, and they want that because what they're counting on, what they're actually counting on is that you're not going to use all sure. of your purchases. Mm-hmm. So think about that, client of any other chain. What they're really after is your signature and your money and not necessarily for you to experience their service. They're not, they're not banking on winning you back because of how terrific their experience is. They're banking on getting you roped in, and so now you sort of have to stick there. And again, so that works as long as that's the only thing, yeah. as that's the only game in town in the same way that McDonald's served its hamburgers yeah. You know, pre-made, pre-dressed. Here's how you get it for decades. Yeah. I, I read a book one time called, this. I think it's called The Subscription Business Model or something. I don't remember. The, uh, I'm really struggling with my uh, book names, book titles today. But um, it was talking about that there's there's kind of two different types of subscriptions. And one is, is uh, one that is solely based off of the neglected membership. Right. So I signed up for it and then it's so small and minute that I forgot about right. it. And then, and the, they win significantly because you just forget and you don't cancel. And then there's a whole other membership model of value added proposition that you continue to grow with it because of that reason. Right. But it's it's very unfortunate that there's a lot of businesses out there that have made a lot of money based off of the fact that they're just hoping that you forget to use their service uh, rather than finding ways to find add value. Right. right. So. With that, uh, the the uh, kind of understanding the the uh, reason that people would want to do business with you. One of the things that we talk about in our organization a lot is understanding the problems that our customers are having and how we can help solve those problems. I think that's kind of the same end goal that you're talking about. We're just coming at it from a different way because um, because that's the reason that people need to use us is because they have problems sure. that need to be solved. So, um, but it, but a, I think the natural state for most any business is just to come and show up and throw up and tell you all of the <laughs> things that they have right. versus really understanding the the customer. And I think that's ultimately in everything that you've said this this far thus far is either understand your customer, understand your audience, understand what drives them, and then once you have that understanding, then you can speak directly to them based off of that. that. That's right. And and you can and you can speak in interesting ways. Yeah. In in other ways. It, it's not always so literal. If you can get to where I mean you, you have to deal in your literal, your business proposition, your no contract, no membership fees, your proposition for your business. Yes, that's solving an issue. Mm. That's solving a need, whether it's in security or you know, a lot of people who come to us, it's the, my back issue, my this, my that. They're having a specific problem that they're looking to have addressed. So there's that problem-solving aspect. Mm-hmm. But in reality, in so many things, uh, there, there's something more. Mm-hmm. There's something less literal, um, or, or maybe I should say less tangible, okay. less physical that people are looking for. And like in my world, mm-hmm. uh, the Zen massage world, they want... It, 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 it's the experience. They just want to feel good. They, their phone's off. Their eyes are closed. They're, they're being catered to. It's an escape. Yep. And so that's what they're after. And I would venture to guess that in your world, people come to you and they have tangible needs. Mm-hmm. You have tangible solutions. But I'd be willing to, to bet a lot that what they really want is to not have to think about security. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
They, they just want to know that it works. This is covered. Yeah. It's worked. I want peace of mind. I want to not be worrying about, you know, this, that, or the other. And, um, you know, so that's the other that they're really after. Yeah. Okay. So I've got two questions to, to close out. Uh, number one, now that you're a CEO, what is one of the biggest things that you've learned uh, maybe that you weren't expecting as a CEO f- coming from all of the other things that you've done in in the CEO role? What is what is the biggest thing that you've learned so far that you've been surprised about? Uh, be careful because you never know when there's going to be a pandemic. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, <laughs> that has been the biggest game changing. Mm-hmm. And we've all talked about it so much, but I mean, my gosh, that just brought yeah. so much change. I, I'll tell you honestly, though, and this, take this right, because this is not to say that I'm, I'm doing super well or perfectly, but I've worked for and with some incredible individual business owners and executives. Okay. And I have studied these people. I've watched them. I've learned from them. Um, and, and I've seen the hassles and the headaches, too. So, I've very much known what to expect and and what I want to be. Gotcha. Um, with with me, the issues are okay. Do you deliver that every day? And and how much of certain things can you deliver today? And something has to wait for tomorrow. So I mean, there's reality and humanity in my own fallibility. Hmm. But God, I, I have to tell you, I've, I've worked for two or three legendary radio stations mm-hmm. with great managers and owners. And in the world of McDonald's, I mean, you know, you can make all the jokes you want about McDonald's because they're, you know, a big, huge company now. But I worked very closely with brilliant people and just had a, a terrific, re- reported directly to a couple of their CEOs, mm-hmm. uh, worked very closely with them and, and the owner of the agency I worked for, Tom Morak. So I, I have sucked it in from some really uh, incredible people along the way. So that falls into my second question. Uh, you mentioned earlier that one of your favorite pastimes is basically being outside and reading. Mm-hmm. What, it, what, you, what have you been reading lately? Last book I finished uh, entirely was um, Alice's Adventures in Wonderland and Through the Looking Glass and What Alice Found There. So I, I read those two and then I went back and reread. This is, you know, a 30 year span. I reread uh, The Old Man and the Sea as well as the short true life story that Hemingway wrote that preceded um, The Old Man in the Sea. So those are a couple that I've read um, recently. I I, I go out in places and tangents like that. Mm -hmm. And I've I've picked back up uh, in in the last couple of years since I've taken ownership of Zen Massage and, Mm -hmm. and this role, I've picked back up Covey. I've picked back up some Peter Drucker. I've, uh, you know, picked back up some of those kinds of things that are a part of me along the way. But wh- when I'm reading, I'm often, you know, going uh, way out into those other places, James Berry or uh, Fitzgerald or Conroy or uh, people of uh, people of that sort. That's, that's a big part of your storytelling experience. It is. And, and all of those uh, pieces in various ways, um, you know, I guess inform or create me. Mm-hmm. That's, a, that's a intriguing. I would say my big takeaway from today so far, because this conversation has been awesome, but I didn't realize as big of a student as you were. And that's, that's the big thing that comes out in the conversation is you're a student across the board and, now, and then you're sharing what you're learning. Uh, it, you know, there's some there's some truth in that, but if, if you know, if, if I talk about how much truth I think there might be in that, then it might make me think that I'm I'm letting people think that I knew more about what the hell was going on for over all of these years, which is somewhat not true, and also incredibly true. Uh, you know, in, in in certain ways. I mean, you're absolutely right. Well, in true Keith Larson style. Thank you very much for joining us today. I, I appreciate the conversation. I've learned a lot, and it's been a, a pleasure sitting and chatting with you. It's been fun. You've made me think, and uh, I, I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me.
Keith, thanks again for joining us today. It was a blast. I got a new perspective on how you see things and how you've connected with people over the years. For those of you who are listening for the first time, we again ask you to subscribe because we do have a brand new episode every Tuesday morning at 9 a.m. And we want you to be there for every single one of them. Thanks for joining us. And we'll see you next time right here on the Coffee Break Podcast.